All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I want to try to record sort of a patch for uh, the tutorial that I gave on Thursday, the 30th of January, 2014. Uh, we wound up basically having to switch what we were teaching right before the tutorial so things didn't come out anywhere near as cleanly as I would have liked. Uh, Ladislav and I got together after the tutorial and spent a while trying to figure out how we can present this uh, really well. So here is my attempt at coherently explaining the problem of how to design an interval tree by augmenting an AVL tree. So. This is about halfway through the tutorial, maybe a third of the way through the, through the tutorial. And here we're going to look at the problem of scheduling conflict. So suppose that you have a calendar, like a Google Calendar, and it contains a whole bunch of time intervals where you're busy, like this really busy chap here on the right. And we want to be able to quickly tell whether a new booking that you're going to throw into your calendar conflicts with an early booking. So you want to have some sort of algorithmic way to answer this question. Uh, does this conflict with an existing booking, and what is that booking? So breaking the problem down, what you have to do for this task is design a data structure to efficiently do the following. Insert an interval x into d, the data structure, delete an interval x from the data structure, and search for an interval. What you want search to do is, if the data structure contains any interval with, that overlaps with x, you should return any of those intervals. Any such interval will do. We don't really care uh, about returning all of the intervals. As a matter of fact, that's kind of bad because the next point is that we want all functions to run in big O of log n time and in fact if you return all overlapping intervals it's possible that you may have to return every single interval in the entire data structure and there can be order n of those so as a matter of fact if we change this ADT description slightly so that you have to return all such intervals all of a sudden you can't do this in logarithmic time so here we're just going to return any such interval if there are no intervals that overlap with x we return null so this is really the hard part of what we're going to do here. So let's start to think about how this data structure should look. I want to stress that figuring out these kinds of augmentation problems to see how you can accomplish something that an AVL tree or red-black tree or some other balanced tree can't initially do, but you're going to give it the capability to do, this is a really hard thing to do. Getting it right the first time is extremely hard. Usually there's a lot of trial and error involved. So what we need to do is insert a bunch of intervals into the tree. How are we going to do that? We need to treat something as a key. You can't really treat an interval itself as the key. The entire interval can't be a key. Um, because if you do that, then there isn't really a clear way to compare intervals, like which of these two intervals is greater. I mean, they overlap, and intervals can overlap in quite a few ways. It would be a very messy comparison, to say the least. So what we do is we use the low end point of the interval as the key. So here's an example tree. In this example tree, this is a search tree if you're considering the keys to be the first or lower end point, the low end point. So if we look at an in-order traversal of this tree, we'll see that it actually gives us the end points in order, which is kind of nice. So we have 8, 16, 26, 36, 29, 36, 30, 34, 48, 52, and 60, 80. An in-order traversal gives us these intervals in order, which is kind of nice. Okay, so the first big question to ask is what function do we want to compute using the data that we're going to augment the tree with? So this is the question, does an interval x intersect any interval in the tree? What info should we store or augment each node with uh, to try to compute this information? This is really a really difficult part. So this, I'm going to put this in here kind of like an ansatz or an educated guess, and I'm going to show that this works but in general, getting the exact information that you should store at each node correct the first time is very difficult. So what we're going to store at each node is this mhi of u, m hi of u, which is the maximum high endpoint of any node in the subtree rooted at u. How can we use this information that we've now augmented each node with to compute the desired function? This is really the next difficult question. And we want to do this efficiently, which means by looking only at a small number of nodes. So we want to look at information available only in a small constant number of nodes that are close to u in order to compute uh, our desired function here. Does an interval intersect with any interval in the tree? We're going to modify this slightly. We're going to say, does an interval x intersect any interval in the subtree rooted at u? And we're going to solve that problem first. Once we've solved that, we will have solved it for the whole tree, as we'll find out. 
So let's start to think about an algorithm for search, this special search, within a subtree. So search here has three arguments. It has low and high, which are the endpoints of the interval that we're looking for to see if anything intersects with, and u, which is the node that we're starting with. So this should return an interval in the subtree rooted at u that intersects low high or null if none exists. So this first line is pretty obvious. If u is null, then there's definitely nothing in the subtree rooted at u that intersects low high, so we just return null. Now we test if low high, the interval, intersects the interval of u. If so, we return the interval of u. I hope this is also pretty obvious. Here we found an intersection, so we return it. If we don't find an intersection, we have this case, else no intersection. In this case, we check if low, the low endpoint of the interval we're looking for, is less than low of u. And before I explain what we're doing here, I'll try to show why we do what we do. So here is this node u, here it's left and right subtrees. Here is uh, a depiction of the interval of u, from low of u to high of u. Now, what does the interval of the search, the interval we're looking for, look like in this diagram? So here's a first attempt at it. Here, from low to high, this is the interval that we're searching for. What do we know about this interval? Well, I've left this uh, no intersection highlighted, so it'll stand out to you. This low to high interval can't intersect the interval of u, so it has to appear entirely to the left of the interval of u, or entirely to the right of that interval. And here, if low is less than low of u, so in this case, low is less than low of u, which means that this has to fall entirely to the left of the interval of u. So actually it looks like this, something like that. Now, in this case, we know something kind of interesting. Every node, v, on the right side of this dotted line has low of v greater than high. So every interval to the right here cannot possibly intersect with low high, the interval we're searching for. So let's see why that's true. So we already know there's no intersection between low high and low u high of u. We know that low high falls to the left of the interval of u. And since this is a search tree where the keys are the lower endpoints of the intervals, the lower endpoints in the right subtree of u have to be at least as large as the low endpoint of u. So low endpoints in the right subtree here have to all be at least as large as low of u, which means they all have to fall on the right side of this line, which means none of them can intersect this interval that we're looking for. So that means we don't have to search for this interval, any intersections with this interval that we're looking for at u or in the right subtree here. So what we have to do is only search this left subtree for any possible intersections with our low high interval. So that's what we're doing here. We return search, the same interval, low high, but now in the left subtree of u. So the next case that we'll look at is the else case, where low is greater than or equal to low of u. So let's look at what that looks like. Again, here is our u and our left and right subtrees. Here is our interval of u. And again, I have to ask, what does our low high interval that we're looking for look like? So here's a first stab at it. Here's low high. What do we know, though? We know that low high cannot intersect with the interval of u. So it has to fall entirely to the left of the interval of u here, or entirely to the right of the interval of u, somewhere over here. And we know that low is greater than or equal to low of u. So that means this has to fall to the right of this point, and it doesn't intersect, so it has to fall over here. So this low high has to come entirely to the right of the interval of u. Now we also know that low is greater than m high of the left subtree here. So the maximum high endpoint of this left subtree is less than low. Low is greater than the maximum high endpoint in this left subtree. So what this means is every node v on this side of this dotted line has a high endpoint that is to the left of this dotted line that's less than low. That means none of these guys can possibly intersect this interval low high that we're searching for. And that means that we can sort of cross off this whole section and not bother searching this subtree for any intersections. 
So we only have to search this subtree for intersections, and that's exactly what we do here. We return search the same interval low or high, but now in the right subtree of u. Okay, for the final case, we're in the else case here, so low is less than or equal to m high of the left subtree. And let's take a look at what that looks like. So here we have our node u and the two subtrees. Now here is our interval of u. In this case, we know that there's, there's some node in this subtree that has the maximum high endpoint of any node in this subtree. Some node has the, has the largest endpoint in this subtree, so let's call that node v. And here, the high endpoint of v is the maximum uh, high endpoint of anything in that subtree. So v is just that node with the maximum high endpoint of all the nodes in this subtree. Now, where does low high, the interval we're looking for, have to fall in this diagram? So we know that it, it doesn't intersect the interval of u, so it has to fall all the way to the left of, of this interval of u, or all the way to the right. We also know that low is greater than or equal to low of u, which means that it has to fall to the right. The interval that we're looking for has to be to the right of the interval of u. Finally, we know that low is less than or equal to m high of left of u, which is our high of v here. So low is less than or equal to this point, so it's to the left of this point. And it's to the right of this point. So low high falls somewhere in the middle like this. And in particular, we know that low high will intersect the interval of v. Uh, the one thing that may be missing in my explanation about why this intersects this interval, we certainly know that, that this high of v has to be greater than low. We also need to show that this low of v is less than low, so that this interval wraps around low. To see why this low of v is less than low, we just notice that low of v, well, v appears in this subtree, which is to the left of u, and since low, you know, low endpoints of each node are the keys of the data structure, the key has to be less than the key of u, so low of v has to be less than low of u. And we already know that low and high both come to the right of this whole interval u, low of u, high of u. So low is greater than low of u, which is greater than low of v. So basically low has to fall within this interval, which means that this interval intersects the interval low high that we're looking for. So there is definitely an interval in the left subtree of u that intersects low high. Maybe there's some other interval in the right subtree that also intersects low high, but all we really need to do is return any of them. So we know that we can recurse into the left subtree and we will definitely be able to find some interval that intersects the one we're searching for. If, if we were only interested in answering the question, is there an interval that intersects the one we're searching for, we could just stop without even recursing, because we know that there is one down here. But since we're interested in actually returning an inter interval, we have to recurse into this subtree, and that's what we do here. When we return search, the same low high, but now in the left subtree of u. So that's the final algorithm. The only extra bit is now we've solved it for each subtree u, we need to get the answer for the whole tree, and we can just put that together by making a single call to search for low high starting at the root of the data structure. A brief word on how you would prove this is correct, I basically walked you through all of the cases just now, but to prove that this search function works, this search function is a recursive function, so what you have to do is you have to assume that it works. Uh, first I have to state what the search function's post condition is, uh, or what, the, what its preconditions and postconditions are. So the precondition is there is some... Uh, sorry, I'll back up for one second. So the postcondition is if there is an interval that intersects low high in the subtree rooted at u, then search will return an interval uh, that intersects low high in the subtree of u. So in order to prove that search works, and works means satisfies the post condition, then we need to assume that these recursive calls to search work because they're working on a smaller problem size. Uh, the problem size here is uh, the height of the subtree. So we're calling it on a child, so the subtree height is smaller. So we assume that, that these searches, the recursive calls to search, all work properly. They satisfy their post conditions. And then we prove that if those post conditions are satisfied for these recursive searches, then this outer search will satisfy its post conditions. That's how you do it uh, formally.
uh, and there is no actual precondition that I can think of, except maybe the obvious things for consistency, like low has to be less than or equal to high, and u has to uh, actually be a node, not some weird data structure. Stuff that I wouldn't write in a theoretical precondition. Okay, so here, let's look at the algorithms for insert and delete. They're a lot simpler. So, to insert into d some interval x, which is just low up to high, you first do a regular AVL insertion of key low, and you store high at the same time in the node, but the key is going to be low. Then you set this m high variable of the new node to high, because this new node is just going to be an isolated new node inserted at the bottom of the tree, and it is going to have this guy as its maximum uh, high endpoint in its subtree, because its subtree is just itself, it's a leaf. Then we fix balance factors and perform our rotations as usual, but we also update the m high variable of u whenever you update the balance factor of that node. So basically this means after you do this you have to update m high of u for all the ancestors and for every node involved in a rotation. And you can use this formula, m high of u is the max of the high endpoint of u and the maximum high endpoint of anything in its left subtree and the maximum high endpoint of anything in its right subtree. And this information, m high of right of u and m high of left of u, are just, they're just variables stored at left and right. So this is just reading three local variables. So this is a constant amount of work. Delete is quite similar to insert, so I won't go into that. It's pretty easy. I'll leave this as basically an exercise for you at home to figure out how you would transform this first part for insert into something similar for delete. Uh, the only real catch, I think, is that maybe you have to do something different with setting the m high of the new node because sometimes when you delete uh, well I guess there there isn't a new node so I guess maybe it's it's fairly straightforward so anyway I'll leave that as kind of a home exercise for you guys so let's look really briefly this is the last slide here at why this all takes big O of log n time for all of these operations so for insert and delete the normal AVL insert and delete that you first begin with uh, that's all big O of log n time Plus, you have to add the cost of updating m high for each u on the path from the node that you updated to the root. So the length of this path is at most the tree height, and this is big O of log n in an AVL tree, and it's only constant work to update m high, so that's big O of log n work. Plus, you have to update m high for every node involved in a rotation, so there are at most big O of log n rotations, one per node on the path from the root, uh, to the, you know, from, the, from the node that you modified all the way up to the root and that's at most the tree height, that's because you do one rotation and then you recurse on a parent. So you work your way up the tree doing one rotation at a time. So that's there at most big O of log n rotations, and each of these rotations involves a constant number of nodes, which means there's a constant number of work happening. Therefore, this is a constant times big O of log n, which is big O of log n. So this is big O of log n plus big O of log n plus big O of log n, which is big O of log n. For search, we do a constant amount of work in the function, followed by a recursive call. In each invocation of search, that's what happens. Constant work and recursive call on one child, and then it returns. That recursive call, it does a constant amount of work and another recursive call, and then it terminates. And in this way, the fact that there's a single recursive call and then termination in each of these uh, invocations of search means that you can invoke search and it can recurse, recurse, recurse all the way down the tree one step at a time until it hits the bottom. And at that point, it can't recurse anymore because it's at the bottom of the tree. So that means the number of recursive calls is big O of log n, since the height of the tree is big O of log n, and it's a constant work per recursive call. So that's a total of big O of log n work. So that's it for this. Thank you very much.